Find space assessments. What needs to be in them? That's I this don't know. week's episode. Here we go. Here we go. All right, find space assessments. For everybody needs to know, we do a lot of these a year, and they're not the most exciting thing to do. So right off the bat, uh, we just need to explain what an assessment yeah. is, and it is so not... So here we go. It is not fun, always. <laughs> it's not fun. It's... What it is, you're taking a space... And you're deciding all these things we're going to talk about. Is there a hazard? Is there a problem? How are we going to manage it? All that stuff. But you've got to take each one at your location and break it down individually. And that sometimes when you look and say, that's going to take a while. It's just. Yeah. It's not a determination. It's not deciding, is it a space or is it not? So we have. So that was last episode. So that this one is. I got to write some procedures, basically. Yeah. This is basically kind of the outline of we've already decided it's a space. What do I got to do to. Make sure that my employees are safe if they're having to work in or, you know, around or whatever to, in that space. I should be able to take the permit and re- reference the assessment and fill out the permit. Yeah, I should be able to lay them side by side. I so if there's say, yep, information on your permit that isn't captured in your assessment, right off the bat, we got to beef up our assessments. Yep. They don't have enough data in them. So that's a first indication. All right. So one of the things we do is is we, we do a lot of these. So we actually have an internal Thousands. we have an internal <laughs> process that Jen built for us. And it's basically we can do it on my phone to speed them up because they do take so long. Yeah, this is so. one of those things where they can't be boilerplate, but it's so tempting to make them boilerplate. I know when you have so many other procedures and assessments that you have to do during the year. It's because it's the so, volume. Yeah, it's so. just so easy to copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. So and the bits, that goes into the first one the right. Very here. first one is they can't be boilerplate. And they can't have every check mark on every one of them all be the same because then basically they're boilerplate. Even though they're you're site specific, they're not. Yeah. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you take a space and you want to list out every hazard with that space. But like mm. Joe said, yes. you can't list them all because you're wanting to cover your behind and you're not really sure. And you can't like have air and that's it. If there's 15 other things that we need to consider. So neither one are helpful. You're not evaluating the space for all the things that could happen in the next 10 years. Yeah, you're you're today, evaluating normal life function of that space. Hour 24 hours And if something's anomaly, then you address the anomaly. But this yeah. is how to normally get into the entry. Yes. So you want to make it site and equipment and space specific. Right. You've got to be very got, detailed on these. Like I said, if I list everything that is an option as a hazard, how, how am I going to do step two? And the next thing is if you have seven of them that are the same, you can write one assessment for the seven, but they have to be identical. They've got to be identical. And, and what not, I mean by identical is everything. Everything identical. identical. Hazards are identical. Stuff yeah. inside the space is identical. Size opening is so identical. it's pretty rare we it, get to do that. Well, I'll give you an example. Condensers. Right. We may have a lot of condensers, but... Different somebody size, different... may have happened to put a flat ladder in front right. of a entry space or, or put somebody the, or put, put the piping. catwalk right here. <laughs> yeah, put the smallest catwalk ever yeah. on this one. And there's or now rails. the entry points way up there. Yeah, I got to climb up there. Still yep. a condenser. So it's the same unit. But what you got to know is that the, the entry and rescue portion for some of these things, even though it's the same piece of equipment or the same it style, it could be completely different hazards for my entrant and my rescuer. Yeah. And so you got to capture that. Going to condenser this way is different than going 20 feet up in the air. And then going down. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. So that's what we got. So that's first. You got to have the real, real, real issues. Real hazards. Real hazards. Real, real spaces. Yep. Site okay. specific. All right. Next one we got to find. Elimination and control for everything you just listed. <laughs> Everything, and that's which, why you don't want to list everything in the world which could because be. your elimination or controls aren't real. Then, if you just listed everything that's not even relevant, like a few months ago, we were at a plant and they brought all the manure from the animals over, and all of a sudden it set off the meters. Yep. Well, I would have never had that in the original. That's why you have to make sure it's the whole time of what could affect the space yeah, as it, a hazard. Because how happen- do you manage it? We had to manage it by not even doing the entry that day. Yeah. What's happening? Around the space, I had set, I had a mixer entry, and there was no CO two pipe to that mixer, but there was CO two in the room, and or it you kept, get dry eyes. Yep, yeah, and it was setting off my meter, and I was like, "We can't do this because we're over the levels, right. you guys. We can't even go in and do this drill." Boiler rooms, you get that? You walk in yep. the COs over the meter before you even do the boiler entry. Yep. So when you're talking about elimination and control, it could be identifying hazards that, you know, if you've got a truck that's going to park right outside your, right. your, your hole in the you ground that you're going in, you may not be times. able to go that. So that's yeah, the elimination control. Identifying that, that as a hazard because it's the whole 24 cycle of how that moves. But also when you eliminate it, it could just be, we can't do the entry during these times. Absolutely. 
The next one, well, just first disclaimer. Again, oh, that's right. Joe and I write thousands of these a year and review thousands of these a year because we review every assessment yeah, our employees you, do. Yeah, you need to know that every assessment for 23 years that has left our company are reviewed and that... A packing house has about 300 to 400 spaces. So, so <laughs> we write them all so the time. So these are just so. our opinions on what we... Saw based on that, yeah. based on that environment. So, so I got to get some PPE. Got to get some PPE. I need to be listing some entry equipment. And I want to emphasize, mm. don't go and buy equipment and gear First. before you do your assessments. Right. You don't let the salespeople tell you to buy all this. You need it when you may no. not need it because your assessment says maybe not. So you want to first figure out what spaces are we breaking the plane or entering in, do your assessment, and then based on what you're entering or breaking the plane on and what that assessment says for your elimination and controls, that's how you decide your you gear. You get a 400 space, you only enter 20. Yeah. So you only buy the gear for the 20. Yes. That's how you manage your cost, because that's yeah. one of the barriers that we hear a lot is the cost. Don't buy it for everything that you have on property because there could be some things we never enter and other spaces we may contract out. So only for what you're doing, don't buy gear first. Figure out what PPE and entry equipment you need, which help kind of support your elimination and control, mainly the control right. piece. And then that's how you decide what you're going to buy. And then, Well, couldn't and I just get out of the PPE if I just reclassify everything? Well, you could, but... The problem with reclassification is this is what's, I think, misinterpreted the most is when I go and I do decide my elimination or controls, those are temporary. So a control doesn't ever work because that's contemporary. I've got to, in order to reclassify, I have to permanently eliminate it. And so when I'm going into a space, that's a temporary elimination potentially, or that's a temporary control. It's, it's a point not in time. Perm yeah, it's a point in time that could at any moment have a problem potentially. And so that's why just deciding an elimination or control, that's not just like, oh, well, I can reclassify the space now. That's part of the steps. Probably not. <laughs> There's yeah. a good chance that you may not. Otherwise, why do we even have permits and why so do don't, we even so do don't, this? Yeah. Don't get caught up in that yeah. is the, the point. Because people do. So. Yep. All right, now I've got my gear. Now I've got my elimination control. I've got all my hazards. I think I'm pretty much done. Well, the last thing that I would really encourage you to have on your assessments would be rescue plans. Because, entry or non-entry. Because that's the part no one puts on their procedures. No, they don't. They Everybody don't. has everything else, so we're good to go. And that's why I bring it up. Because mm -hmm. that, what we said in other episodes, the idea is to get out of there. Yeah. <laughs> so Employee yeah. goes home the same way they came to us. Yep. So we don't want to cause harm. So if they have we a medical event, we still have to get them out of there somehow. Yep. So we want to write what the rescue plan is because that may start the conversation of, do we need to work with our technical rescue from the fire department side? Yep. Can they do this? Can they support us? Can Go, they be on site? Do I need to hire a contractor? A tank, going in a tank right here, three feet in, inspect something. Oh, pretty good. I could probably get somebody out. Yeah. You send me 15 feet up on a tower somewhere and the entrance that's that way. That's going to that's change your rescue plan. Absolutely. And you need to be aware of what that's going to realistically, what can you realistically do? Not the tripod on the top of the round tank. Yeah, that's not realistic. I don't, I don't understand because people will write that. They'll, they'll take no a tank. rails or anything. <laughs> yeah, the tank with no rails with a hole on top. That's We're going to try about like, how? Yeah. Yeah, it's not the way it is currently. <laughs> which means, could you say we're just not even going to go in? And could that be part of the assessment? That could be part of the assessment. Part of it is just deciding this is a non-entry space. That could be part of it. Say, you know, we're going to assess and by some random chance we have to go in or hire a contractor. At least we have a blueprint of here's all the things we have to somehow navigate through and meet in order right. to make entry into that space. Because even if we contract something out, we still, as the host employer, have to provide them a list of the hazards and elimination and controls. So correct, because you know, they don't know. They don't. Yeah, know space. it's our it's our stuff. It's our equipment. Right. So we have to provide them that. There, we can't just say, well, we don't go in. It's a contract problem. We don't need an assessment. Because there's that places work either. that we write assessments just for that. Yeah. They don't do any entries. We write assessments so the contractor can use them. That's correct. That's correct. Because right. they own the space. So if you want more ideas and concepts and and really want to figure out how to break all this down, we have allensafetycoaching.com. You can hop on there. We have an entire confined space module that's going to walk you through baby steps from program through what you should have in your assessment. We show our assessment form and how we complete that. We show you some completed assessments on what those should look like on the end. And then we also walk through, you know, how would you navigate through the training and all of that. Absolutely. Through. We've also got 18 other modules on there, over 100 episodes. It's awesome. And, and then we got some other episodes. We do. Podcasts. So you can reference episode 13, 12 and 13. Those are on podcasts, so Apple, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts if you want to download it and listen to it offline. Otherwise, you can find those on YouTube also. So. Awesome.
All right. Well, if you'd like to contact us, you can reach out through social media. You can follow us on all the social medias. We're on all of them at Allen Safety LLC is our handle for everything. Connect with me and Joe on LinkedIn, Jen Allen, Joe Allen. And other than that, I think that's all we've got for today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you're looking for more in-depth discussions or step-by-step solutions on all of the different safety and regulatory topics, please visit us at www.allensafetycoaching.com for web-based virtual coaching and training or at www.allen-safety.com to book our team for on-site services, training sessions, to order merchandise, to learn more about our team and what services we provide in the field, or to simply to request a topic for us to cover on our next podcast. If you found today's podcast helpful and would like to support our podcast further, please help us by subscribing, liking, and sharing this podcast with anyone that could benefit from the information we cover here as that helps us to continue to put out this free content. Thank you so much for your support.